I was just uh, watching your DVD the other day. I've uh, actually watched it a few times. Uh, Boying will do it live. Uh, it's really awesome stuff. I'm uh, digging the band, and I'm, I can't wait for the tour in October. Oh, thanks. I, I, I uh, you know, the, the DVD after that, Culture Clash Live, isn't even. I feel like it's a better representative of where we are now. Uh, but yeah, Boing will do it live as a, a good first live DVD. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. What can we expect on the tour? We're going to see uh, a lot of songs as well from the new album, uh, Tres Caballeros. Yeah, you know, uh, we have a show put together, uh, a set that's got a lot of songs from Tres Caballeros, but it's also got a couple songs from the Culture Clash album and the first album. And, uh, you know, it's our first time playing Australia, so we are excited, you know. We just can't believe that we are the, uh, you know, we can come down there. First time and the only time I've ever been to Australia is with Joe Satriani, and, you know, he's an artist who's name speaks for itself and he's been all over the world several times but the fact that we can come there as the aristocrats is really special for us yeah awesome stuff now uh, you guys are uh, the aristocrats formed uh, I think it was, you know, six or so years ago and um, I'm just wondering uh, how did it come about and uh, secondly when you came in was it did you guys just start jamming and you know or did you guys come in with like a plan or like anything like that uh, how did that all about. Well, no, well, it started because, well, Marco and I met each other because of Mike Keneally, uh, who I've been playing with for 20 years, used to be Frank Zappa's mm -hmm. guitarist, played with Vi, Satriani, everybody, and he's got an extensive solo career. Mm -hmm. uh, he introduced Marco and I because he wanted us to play gigs of his material together in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so Marco and I knew each other ever since 2005. We were playing intermittently together yeah. uh, on a few things. And then, uh, you know, Marco got asked to do a gig in Vladivostok, Russia, of all places. So he asked yeah. Greg Howe, great guitarist, and me to be a trio with him. So we did that, and we had fun. And then a couple months later, you know, I got asked to do this concert at the NAMM show called the Anaheim Bass Bash. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know, instead of doing something bass, 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 you know, why don't we bring this, this trio that we just worked up? We have the set ready to go. And so they were into it, and we booked it. And then Greg Howe had something come up shortly before the show and couldn't do it. And so then there was, uh, you know, a guy on Facebook who was just the biggest Guthrie fan ever just messaging me over and over again that I had to check out Guthrie, and I never did. So then I finally did, and I was like, oh, my God, this guy's an alien. Mm -hmm. So we reached out to him. You know, so Marco and myself and Guthrie all had solo albums out, so we just decided that we would do two songs from each of our solo material, yeah. uh, our solo catalog. And so it was a six-song set. The first time we got together and we were playing each other's music, we realized that we had something special. And then we did the show, and then there was a really good reaction to it, and we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can take this formula and make it work again. So we, we did the first album, has nine songs on it, we each contributed three songs. And that's how The Aristocrats was born. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, you know just as far as, like, amazing guitarists go, Guthrie's got to be kind of one of my favorites, and think of, like, Steve Vai and Joe Cetriani, they're such big names, but it wasn't probably until about two years ago that I heard of Guthrie Govan. Uh, do you think he's kind of a little bit underrated? Well, it's not so much that he's underrated as that he was underexposed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the people who knew about him knew that he was amazing, but mm -hmm. Guthrie's one of these guys who, like, so we found him in 2011, right, to do this show. Yeah. Someone's like, oh, yeah, Guthrie Govan. So I went online to try and find him, mm -hmm. and you could not contact him. Wow. You know, he had no website with any contact info on it. It was one static page with no links. <laughs> he had no Facebook page. He was not on Twitter. He had a MySpace page, but that was completely out of function. There was no way to reach him. So he's one of, one of these guys who ever got into like self promotion social media. He's very private. Yeah. You know, he he keeps to himself and he's quiet. He just puts it all into the music. So I think that's part of the reason why some people didn't know who he was. You know, uh, and also you know the reason that some people didn't know who he was on the other hand is because he had been hired by this company to make some YouTube instructional videos for them. Yeah. And so there were some underground videos of him circulating around. And some people knew who he was, but there I was in the United States of America already having played with Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, and Mike Keneally, and mm -hmm. I didn't know who he was. And it's like my job to know who these people are, right? So oh, sure. uh, to me, it was just the most fortunate and wonderful thing in the world that no one else had asked Guthrie to be in a band <laughs> before Marco and I asked him to be in a band. What were the chances of that? Yeah. Now, uh, outside of uh, the Aristocrats, you're also known as uh, William Murderface, or the live version of uh, William Murderface. Uh, how did you end up meeting Brendan Smalls and getting connected with Metalocalypse? Because that's absolutely one of my favorite shows of all time. I love every uh, episode of it. 
Yeah, you know what's funny is that like this is so, uh, I'm talking in a second Australian interview now, and like death people know what death clock is down there. You know, in Europe, oh, yeah. death clock is like you know, unless you're a hardcore metal fan, you know, Gene Hoagland, mm-hmm. you know, no one knows what death clock is. So this is actually fun to be able to talk about death clock. First of all, I am not William Murderface. It's only my job to try and make him sound good, which, as anybody who follows the show would know, is actually a very difficult job. So I, I really do the best <laughs> I can to help out old William there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he's not not exactly the world's uh, most prodigal uh, bass player. But anyway, yeah. uh, Brendan Small, uh, emphasis on the singular. I met him through again Mike Keneally. Uh, you know, all roads lead to Mike Keneally. You know, I got the Joe Satriani gig through Mike, and I met Marco through Mike. So that's how the aristocrats was originally started. Originally started, and then Mike Keneally and Brendan were friends. Mm-hmm. Mike Keneally was a fan of Brendan's TV show home movies, yeah. and Brendan was a fan of ours. We just didn't know it. He was following us as far back as 1993 when Mike Keneally and I were in Dweezil Zappa's band Z, him and Holland Zappa, because mm-hmm. Brendan was at Berkeley College of Music before I was. I went there for me in 1993 in Boston, and he went there from 93 to 96. So when Dweezil Zappa band came to Boston in 1994, he was at the show. Yeah. He saw Mike and I play. Wow. So, you know, he knew who we were a long time before we knew who he was, uh, which is just weird. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he had his own television show when he wasn't even yet 30 years old. So it was obvious that he was amazingly talented. Uh, so what, here's, so here's the story, okay? Uh, Mike and, and Brendan already knew each other. Mike invites Brendan to some concert that Mike and I were doing. We were playing as an acoustic duo opening up for a Pink Floyd tribute band. Wow. Not the Australian Pink Floyd band, which everybody <laughs> is familiar with all around the world, but another Pink Floyd tribute band. So I meet Brendan backstage, and... He's like, hi, I'm like, how you doing? And so we talk a little bit. He tells me about, you know, how he's a Berkeley guy and all that. And he says, I'm like, so what are you up to? He's like, well, you know, I just sold this show to Adult Swim, and, and here's the premise. And he goes on to explain to me that there's going to be this band called Death Clock, and that they're like the biggest band in the world. They're a death metal band. They're all super incredibly rich. They're also celebrity idiots. There will be a lot of inside musician jokes. There will be a lot of celebrity jokes, blah, 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 blah. And he's just explaining it to me and how there's going to be real music on the show and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that sounds like it's going to be funny. Like, like, I don't think there's really anything else out there like that. I look forward to seeing that show. And then I forgot about it. I think maybe it was like maybe a year, a year and a half later. I'm driving around Los Angeles, and there's this gigantic billboard on the Sunset Strip. And there's these five animated metal characters, and I'm looking up at it, and it says it's Old Swim on I'm like, it says Metal Aquas. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> is that that thing that, 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 that Mike's friend Brendan was talking about? Is that this? And, of course, it was. And then it became a really, really big hit. And then, you know, this TV show became popular. So the music was popular. Brendan recorded the first album. That became popular. And then Brendan decided he wanted to have a live band to tour it. Uh, and so who did he call? But, you know, Mike Keneally and I, the most metal guys in the world, of course, right? But the thing is, is that, you know, he, I was always a big metal fan. I just never got a chance to be in a metal band because I was always playing gigs with guys like Steve I and, and other kind of like instrumental rock muso guys, which is great, but I'm a, I was a huge fan of the big four thrash metal growing up, and mm-hmm. even classic stuff like, you know, New Wave of British Heavy Metal, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and Black Sabbath before that. Yeah. So the idea that I was going to get to be in a metal band was like, fuck yeah. Mm. Uh, funny story is, uh, it's actually, I don't, I'm not sure if they're still gigging, but there's a local band in Brisbane. Uh, they're a Death Clock tribute band. They're called Clock Blocked. And <laughs> <laughs> Did you say co- it's co- Clock Blocked? Yeah, Clock Blocked. <laughs> well, I, I was going to go to the gig, and I didn't go. And then uh, someone told me, apparently, Brendan Smalls was in town, and he uh, came up on stage and did a few songs with them. And I was so bummed out I missed it, but... Uh, he was in Australia, that. that's right, yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't know anything about it until after it all happened, so I, I missed yeah. out on that show, but uh, it would have been awesome. Uh, uh, it would be super, super fun. Yeah. You I... know, it's so funny, there's, a, there's an ongoing joke about how everybody calls him Brendan Smalls. It's actually small. Small. And so whenever, <laughs> whenever, whenever, whenever Brendan actually is, like, you know, he'll be talk, impersonating someone who's talking to him. So, Brendan Smalls, tell us about this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm one of those guys. <laughs> if, you want, if you want to trigger a good conversation, you can, you can do that. Yeah, for sure. Well, if I ever get to interview him, I'll, I know what his real name is now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, the whole Death Clock thing is, is really great. Brennan is an extremely funny, talented, cool dude. And, yeah. you know, only someone who was, you know, had some special insights on life as well as 
talents in both the television and music realms could have created a show like Metalocalypse. Yeah, definitely. I'll just ask you one more question about uh, Metalocalypse, because I know they're doing a fundraising thing, and I know Metallica even donated money, and I think I might have donated money, or I definitely, yeah, I think I did. And um, I'm definitely happy you keen to do that, and they're going to get it back on Adult Swim, and I think they bounced it back. Uh, have you talked to him lately? Do you know what's happening? Is it going to come back? Because, you know, I'd pay hundreds of dollars to see another season of that show. Well, that's above my pay grade. You know, I don't know, uh, you know, how any of that stuff works. You know, television networks and lawyers and licensing and all that. That's all between Brendan's agents and their agents and all the rest of the stuff. So I have no idea what's happening there. But I do know that, you know, Brendan is excited, you know, has always been excited about the musical aspect of it. Uh, and so maybe there will be something to say about that at some point later on. But I can I have nothing to add, unfortunately, about the whole television world. Oh, well, it was worth a try to get to uh, squeeze some knowledge out of you. Uh, anyway, yeah. we'll go back to talking about your your other projects. Uh, as it, as we're saying, you've played with everyone over the years. Uh, Mike Kennelly, uh, Dweezil Zappa, Joe Satriani, the Aristocrats. When you look back through all the artists you perform with, who have been like you know the top three or four favorites? Uh, well, God, you know, I don't really want to get into, like, this is my favorite, that was my favorite. Uh, all the gigs that I've had, have, have, you know, so I know it's a politically correct answer, but I'm grateful for all the gigs that I've had. They've all been great in different ways. You know, Steve I was really, you know, into, like, kind of pushing you as a player and making, getting the best, the very best out of you. And, and, and Joe Satriani is kind of about just laying back and grooving and, you know, making sure that everybody's kind of loose and having a good time while still delivering a very consistent, simple, kind of more melodic, structured song. Mike Keneally is about anything can happen at any time. The Aristocrats is also about anything can happen at any time, but in a different way. Uh, you know, it's all contributes to this overall uh, patchwork quilt of music that I'm very fortunate to be a part of. Yeah, definitely. Now, I know you uh, studied uh, at uh, Berkeley College of Music, and I play a bit of guitar myself, and sort of at that level where, you know, I can play a Metallica song on bass or on guitar or Led Zeppelin or Iron Maiden, but then when I hear, you know, the Aristocrats or, you know, Yngwie Malmsteen, it's just so above my head, it's just on a different level. Do you recommend going to college to, you know, advance your skills, or is it, you know, what was the thing that, you know, really pushed you to the next level of music? Oh, well, you know, Berkeley College of Music was a big part of it. I mean, I was a ne'er-do-well, miscreant teenager, you know, who was content to, you know, to have some basic ability, but wasn't really practicing very hard, and wasn't making the most of it. And then I got, you know, I got to Berkeley and I realized that, you know, I was going to really have to step up my game in order if I wanted to be a professional musician because everybody there, not everybody there, but a lot of people there were very, very good and they were from all over the world. So, you know, that was a part of it. But also every gig I've ever had has taught me something more about being a musician, you know, whether it's technical or sonically or just in terms of being a human being. You know, I, I'm constantly learning even to this day, even to this minute, uh, you know, what it means to kind of be a musician in this world and, and how to apply the lessons that I've learned from the last thing to the next thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll, I'll take that advice on and I'm practicing as much as I can. I always try to put in at least an hour or two a day, so hopefully I'll get to that level one day. Uh, well, you know, it's, I'm here to tell you that there's hope for all the people out there who aren't practicing one to two hours a day because I didn't do it. Mm, definitely. <laughs> Well, I'm really looking forward to your show. I'm going to be there uh, headbanging and also taking some photos. I'll be able to post a link to that on uh, Instagram or Facebook or whichever network you use. Oh, well, you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Uh, I am on Instagram, but not as often. Uh, so, you know, Facebook and Twitter are really the way to go. On Facebook, I'm Brian Beller Bass, and on uh, Twitter, I'm just Brian Beller. Oh, cool. Well, I'll definitely uh, tag you in everything I put on the Internet. Okay, great. Awesome, man. Well, I hope you have a great show and a great tour, and I'm definitely going to be there. It's going to be awesome, man. I can't wait. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, cool. Thanks, Brian. All right, Cheers. cool. Bye.